Thank you very much for coming and thank you for your patience. And uh, the, my Mac can't work, so I have to switch it to a uh, PC so I cannot do the magic show, okay? So sorry about that. Um, so today I'm going to tell you about my dark matter research and uh, galaxy rotation curves. Uh, let's set the stage. So the dark matter research is actually in the area in between particle physics, cosmology, astrophysics, and astronomy, as we will show you. And um, as we all know that uh, dark matter exists in our universe, and uh, there's you know, overwhelming evidence or compelling evidence from all kinds of observations. And uh, it turns out 27% of the mass and energy density, mass and energy density in our universe is made of dark matter. So ordinary matter only makes up 5% of the remaining part of dark energy, right? So, and uh, so to be a dark matter candidate, the, the particle or the object has to be dark, otherwise we should have seen it, and it has, has to be long-lived, because the age of the universe is 13.7 billion years. It's very long. If, you know, if it's short-lived, it will decay away. And uh, it, has a, it has to be cold because you see the structures like a galaxy and so on and so forth. So if it is a relativistic, when it's decoupled from the thermal bath, then you, know, it, you wouldn't uh, form the structure as you see. And uh, so you cannot see the matrix show here. So what I wanted to show you is that those are the, all the known particles, the fundamental particles we have discovered. Um, so in the center, it's like a Higgs, the most recently discovered particle. Surrounding the Higgs particle, these are like uh, 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 gauge mediators, like a photons, a gluons, Z photons, and W photons. And uh, in you know, this layer shows all the matter particles, like quarks, and uh, like leptons, and a neutrino, and so on and so forth. So if you look at all known particles, it turns out that none of them can be dark matter candidate, because none of them can satisfy all these three conditions. So now it's interesting, because on the one hand, you have a standard model of modern cosmology, you know, it, where you need a dark matter to explain the observations. On the other hand, there's a standard model of modern physics, modern particle physics. It is a very successful uh, model, but there's no dark matter candidate. So it's a great opportunity to young people to work on this subject. And uh, so here I wanted to mention one particular dark matter model, because for particle physicists, it's easy actually to cook up something that to be a dark matter candidate. So what you do now is that you go through the, all those uh, fundamental interactions and uh, ask how can dark matter interact with all known particles. Of course, there's a gravitational interaction. There's no question about this. There's no electromagnetism interaction. There's no strong interaction. And probably there's a weak interaction. Because in 1970s, you know, the experimental limits were not so great. People thought, OK, it's a great idea to think that dark matter may carry the weak interaction. Because it carries the weak interaction, and you can produce it, and you can detect it, the Wimper particle. So over the past 30 years, most of the searches for dark matter in the laboratories have been focused on the WIMP model or WIMP paradigm. But after years of the search, the result is we don't see any WIMP signals. Okay. So although all those searches are based on the WIMP model or WIMP paradigm, but what really tells us is that the interaction strength between normal matter and the dark matter uh, uh, is very, very highly constrained, right? aside from gravity. And I should mention that the WIMP, a weakly interacting massive particle, is a typical cold dark matter candidate, right? So why I mention this? Well, in particle physics community, we usually talk about WIMP. But, you know, in cosmology, astrophysics community, we actually, they, most of people don't use the WIMP, this terminology. They really care about, they use a name called a CDM, called a cold dark matter uh, scenario. So this is, this is in the prevailing dark matter theory, that is the, the CDM, we call it the CDM, that dark matter is assumed to be collisionless over the cosmological time scale, aside from gravity, right? It's, it's collisionless. So sometimes it can be confused that C actually refers to code, as I mentioned. The, an, another like hidden assumption is that the dark matter is collisionless, aside from gravity. So, and given those, this strong constraints, it looks like 
you know, the hope to detect the dark matter in the laboratory is pretty low, looks like, right? After the 30 or 40 years of the search, to work, what are we going to do? But although the, most of the people uh, in the community focus on how the dark matter interact with standard model particles, but I, what I wanted to ask is that, is there any possibility or is there any interesting consequence if dark matter has self-interaction? Because if you look at the visible sector, most of the, uh, actually almost all of the matter particles have self-interactions. Like the electrons have the collisions, and they can interact one another. Protons, neutrons, everything, right, can interact with each other. But why people don't consider this possibility? So, you know, about like 10 years ago, I started to uh, uh, think about this problem, but especially after I joined uh, you say ah, so I, I take it very seriously, try to figure out whether dark matter has self interactions or not. The reason is that once you start to have a stable job, you don't care about what peop other people are doing, right? So you, you work on the something you think which is important. Uh, so these are the main publications I've done over the five years on this topic. Of course, it's a relatively new object, subject. It takes a lot of time to work on this. So I worked pretty hard as we captured by this image. And I work on this you know, in a dream during the faculty meeting. You know, this. Thank you, Flip. <laughs> <laughs> so don't, don't see, you know, beside him, you know, during faculty meeting. All right. Right, so let's take one step back to ask what the CDM, the traditional theory, will give you. Right? So why people care, you know, most of people care about the CDM. The reason is it, remark it works remarkably well in explaining the structure of the universe. For example, if you look at the large scale structure, like a lambda CDM, the lambda represent dark energy. Right? So this shows like two point of correlation function. You know, the details don't matter really. But what really important is that you look at the red curve. This is from lambda CDM prediction. And there are different observations, and the agreement is remarkable. Right, so that's the reason why we take lambda CDM uh, very seriously. So this is a large scale. Now let's look into small scales. By small scales, we mean you know the galaxies and the halos, the dark matter halos. And this is a cosmological simulation of structure formation. This is a, the, the cosmic web made of dark matter. But if you look in, zoom into this region, you will see a dark matter halo. So, so this is a Milky Way size halo, and the Milky Way is really you know, you can think about sitting in the center. And uh, so there are many subhalos. You know, the, look at those bright spots. So inside of the main halo, there are subhalos. We'll come back to this point. Now, you look at the distribution of dark matter inside the halo. Actually, for CDM, there's a very, very remarkable prediction. Doesn't matter what system you, you simulate from dwarf galaxies to galaxy clusters, the dark matter distribution inside a, a halo can be parametrized by this formula, okay? This is called a fame NFW profile. There are two parameters, like a scale radius and a scale density you have to look into the simulations to figure out. So for halos on different sizes, that will, will, will have these two different, th those parameters will be different. But very schematically, this profile actually uh, can be understood in this way. So in the valley in the region, it goes like a one over R, right? So the density increases very fast. If you go to the large region, there's an intermediate region that goes like one over R squared, like it drops. But even if you go to the even larger uh, radius, the density drops even faster. Okay? So there's some you know, story to tell you know, how these two parameters are correlated and so on and so forth. But very schematically, you will, what you will see is that in the very inner region, the density increases very fast. So that's the prediction of the lambda CDM prediction, uh, the model. And uh, uh, we should be careful that those are the simulations without the barriers. You know, if you have galaxies, you know, the galaxy formation can be complicated, and in some cases, you may change the density profile. But I'll come back to this point later. But this is zero order of the lambda CDM prediction. So we're going to test this. So what are we going to test is, is we're going to look at the galaxies. We, because we do not detect the dark matter directly, we're going to look at the motion of stars and the gas particles to infer what is the dark matter distribution in a galaxy. So take this dwarf galaxy an example, DDO154, 
And for our galaxy, there's this data contribution, right, to the rotation curve, the circular velocity as a function of radius. And then there's a gas contribution, there's a dwarf galaxy, so it's gas rich galaxy. And this curve, uh, this, the, 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 the data with error bus are, you know, for, from observations of the, so the, the rotation curve. If you add them up, you don't get the point. That's the reason why you need dark matter. So the circular velocity has halo contribution, stellar contribution, and a gas contribution. So you have to add this contribution. So take an FW profile predicted by lambda CDM, and you normalize the parameters such that it can fit to the outer region. But in the inner region, this profile overfits the rotation curve, right? And the reason is simple because if you look at the density profile, and if W goes like this, the quarter profile goes like this, this red profile agrees with the observation very well, right? So in other words, this is a so-called core versus cusper problem because the observation tends to show that you have density cores, but uh, theoretical prediction shows you have density cusps, right? So this is a very old problem. Uh, goes back to 1994, and even before the NFW paper, right, that people noticed the, the issue uh, uh, when the observation of like a rotation curve of dwarf galaxies were available back then. But this is not, so people debated for many years, but this is not the end of the story, because you do see galaxies which are completely consistent with the lambda CDM prediction, as shown here, the highlighted by Omer. So these are the four dwarf galaxies. Um, if you look at the asymptotic circular velocity, it's, they are all very small, right? For Milky Way, it's about 200 kilometers per second, but those are the much below this, uh, the value that, uh, the, like a uh, Milky Way case. And uh, you see the, the data points with error bars are from observations, and the colored bands are from lambda CDM simulations. Those simulations take into account feedback take into account the galaxy formation and so on and so forth. So we have some assumption of the feedback model. Those feedback models, are, uh, in those feedback models, uh, you know, the feedback effect is weak, so the halo profile will not be changed. So it's essentially an FW profile. So you do see the agreement, right? It's not a core versus cusper problem. It's a core and a cusper problem. So you need to get both. You can make the story more interesting if you have a large sample of the data you can choose the galaxies which have the same Vmax, same observed Vmax, right? So let's say you choose these four galaxies. All of them have a Vmax around 80 kilometers per second. Then you look at the inner regions. This galaxy, um, you know, the circular velocity becomes Vmax at 2 kpc in the very inner region. So consistent with the lambda CDM. This one has a large density core up to like a 10 kiloparsec, right? The 10 kiloparsec for this dwarf galaxy is a lot because the distance from the, uh, from the galactic center to the solar system is about eight kiloparsec. But this is for the Milky Way, bigger system. This is dwarf galaxy, right? Eight, eight, you know, 10 kiloparsec is a lot. And uh, these two are sitting in the middle. So all of the galaxies that have the same Vmax, which means, which indicates all of the galaxies are hosted by the halos which have the, about the same mass, because the Vmax is pretty much determined by, by the halo mass. But then why in the inner region the density profiles are so different? And you can parameterize this diversity by plotting the Vmax, the Vmax, or the V circular value at 2 kp as a function of Vmax. Right? For each galaxy, you, you pick up a point uh, in this plane. And you look at the spread, the blue curve, Blue points are from you know, the, the, the observation. This is the mean value. And this is a lambda CDM without the baryons. If you have a baryons in this particular simulation, and you get this. The problem is that you have to explain the scatter. Why there's such a big spread? Or if you don't explain, you have to accommodate the spread in observations, right? So that is a challenge. It's a big challenge in CDM. In the rest of my talk, I'm going to show that the diversity is expected if dark matter has a strong self-interactions. So what is self-interacting dark matter? All you need to do, you make one more assumption. You assume that dark matter particles have collisions. And then you have, there's a measure to, 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 to capture this collision effect is the cross-section per mass. Because in dark matter, you know, in observation, you only look at the mass density. You cannot figure out what is the mass 
uh, the, the number density is because you don't know dark matter mass. So you take this parameter, one centimeter square per gram. You don't need to remember this number. It's very close to the nuclear scale cross section, just like a proton, proton, proton neutron interaction cross section is in this scale. With this cross section, collisions can happen you know, a few times a page of a galaxy, right? So this is a simulation result. I have from right hole, a postdoc here. I hear the particle physics, but you spend a month actually write a code to capture this uh, effect in embodied simulation, which is pretty remarkable to me. So what you do is you set up an initial condition. It's an isolated simulation. It's like a CDM. Then you turn on the collision, you wait for 10 giga years, and you get a shallow density profile like this. Right? So why does this happen? Well, it's very suggestive to look at the velocity dispersion profile. Velocity dispersion measures the temperature of the particles. Right? It's like a thermodynamics as a function radius. So this is CDM. It looks like this. In the central region, it becomes cold. It increases if you go to large radii. So this is determined by galaxy formation. If you have a CDM, you run simulation, you will get this. Right? this is, you don't, there's no choice. However, once you turn on collisions, the collisions will transport heat from outer region to the inner region. Then those inner particles become heated up. They gain, they gain kinetic energy. They try to occupy the large radius. That's the reason why density becomes shallower, right, without the baryons here. Then if you look at the dispersion profile, it becomes flat. Right? It's, it's almost a flat. It's independent of the radius, roughly, you know, especially in the inner region. This is very important because from your high school thermodynamics, you learn that if the system or object has a constant temperature everywhere, which means the system in equilibrium, or in, at least in quasi equilibrium. If it's in equilibrium, its distribution is determined by the Boltzmann distribution. Right? That will motivate us, actually, to construct an analytical model to model dark matter distribution. Because to explain the diversity problem, you have to fit the data. And different galaxies have different halos. You have to choose, you know, tune the parameters and uh, to, to accommodate all the observations. It's a lot of work to do, right? So as a poor particle physicist, who, who, someone who knows nothing about simu embody simulations, we're going to go to your high school thermodynamics. So what you do is you take a halo, you divide the halo into two regions. In the inner region, collisions to summarize the system. You treat this the ideal gas system. You take an equation of state, a PV equals NRT, right? That's what you learn. Right? Then you assume that's a thermal distribution. If you integrate out the energy, the thermal distribution is just giving you, you, you have the potential, the gravitational potential, right? which is important because self gravitating system. And the potential, total potential, is equal to the dark matter potential plus the baryon potential. And you can relate the potential to the matter distribution. This is Poisson's equation, right? This is, a, this is one equation we want to describe the galaxy. Right? If you talk to simulators, no one will believe you. Like, like we have a hardcore simulator, Laura. She doesn't believe you. Uh, so now what we do is we're going to do an analytical model. And uh, my colleague, you know, with Peter, Peter is in the audience, and also my student or our student, uh, Omid. So I send the OMIDA to Laura. I say, oh, by the way, although I don't know nothing about embodied simulation, but you know, my student wanted to learn this. Maybe let's work together on this. Right? And uh, this is uh, actually the, the laptop versus you know, computer class, of course. Right? For this, you, know, you can do it. You know, in, that's the difference. Right? But it's, it's very important that you have both approaches, because you, know, you, you want to confirm your, 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 your analytical model and, uh, by, by simulations and vice versa. Right? Um, so, so let's explain how SIDM solved the problem. Right? So let's look at the galaxy over there. Those are the galaxies have central density which is below the lambda CDM prediction. So those are, those are the galaxies you needed to have a large density course. Then if you look at the very carefully of those galaxies, you, like, like what I did, you know, you look into like individual one by one, and you realize those are the galaxies, dark, dark matter dominated the galaxies, which are the, yeah. Yeah, the, yeah, so that, that's a good point. So this model, I will show you another model later, but this model does not take into account the evolution history. 
in older case, the state is now. Okay, because now it's in equilibrium. So you can use it. But I will show you another analytical method. You can trace the history. Right? Very late. So they, then you look at the, those galaxies. Those are the galaxies. You need a density core. Now you go back to the isosomal distribution. You replace this potential by the dark matter older potential. And you know from simulations that the thermolytic system without the baryons, the central density will be lower. Right? So you can bring this down, this you know, curve down. So then if you look at it very carefully, you know, this down here, this outliers, you know, about 20 is 2 kpc, right? If you choose a galaxy Vmax is 70, actually you do get like 20, right? This, when I made the plot of this, I was like, oh, this must be true, okay? Because otherwise, how can you get the coincidence, right? This must be true. Okay, so those are the galaxies you need a large density course. That, that's what the high SIDM explains. But this is not the end of the story, right? To explain the diversity, you also need to explain those guys. Right? Otherwise, you are cheating. Right? Those are the galaxies completely consistent with lambda CDM. So if the SIDM only generated large density cores, you wouldn't be able to accommodate those guys. Right? So however, if you look at those galaxies, you realize those are called high surface brightness galaxies. In the central region, it's dominated by baryons. Right? Now, you go back to your isosomal distribution. You replace the potential by baryon potential. Now, the baryon potential, because we look at the, the baryon distribution now, we don't care about the formation history. So you look at the luminosity function you can measure, and you can figure out what is the baryon distribution is. You can plug into this potential to predict what the central dark matter distribution is. So this is what you show. This is the density of functional radius. This is the SIDM, only without the baryons. If you add a baryon potential, you fix its mass, but if you change its concentration, the central density increases if the concentration increases. Because the potential is deep, it will attract more SIDM particles to build up the density. That's simple. So we did this when we tried to figure out this analytical model. Actually, this is what uh, everyone ignored you know, in the literature. When you talk about SIDM, people just say, yeah, generate a large density course. But no, it's not. It's really dependent on the baryon concentration. So once you take all those into account, that's how you explain the diversity. So I choose eight galaxies. Um, you show the maximum diversity you would expect. Okay, this mass is about, Vmax is about 80. And if you look at the inner region, it's a factor of four spread. These are the data with error bus uh, uh, from observations, and the solid curves are from SIDM fit. So we summarize, there are three important points. One is the spread in the halo mass concentration is important. So it's essentially saying that some galaxies are just more dense than other galaxies. This is from structure formation. This is from the structure formation, right? So different formation histories of the halo have different concentrations, the central density, right? The scattering is important. The barrier distributions are important. You have to fully take that into account. And for high surface brightness galaxies, the barrier concentration is high. And for low surface brightness galaxies, barrier concentration is low. You have to take that into account. The, what SIDM does is that the collisions will thermalize the inner region and it can tie the dark matter and the baryon distributions together. Right? So that explains the full range of diversity. So we'll lose three papers on this. So those are the people who made important contributions. Ayuki Kamara was my first postdoc when I came here. Uh, what he did was he solved this Poisson equation. Uh, you may think, wow, Poisson equation, why? It takes a, a postdoc six months to solve it. The reason is that because the disk distribution the, the barrier distribution is not spherically symmetric. It has disk. So you have to solve it in a cylindrical coordinate. Right? So it's very complicated numerical problem. And he solved it. He did a remarkable job. Solve it. Uh, then generate a numerical templates. Right? So you can fit each galaxy. You can fit within two minutes. Right? So that's very important. And Peter and Omeda run the simulations. Um, so I wanted to you know, explore this problem from the simulation perspective. Okay, this is the second paper. Then my student, Tao, here, uh, with uh, uh, two people from UC Irvine, and Agua and Manoj Kaplinga, we actually analyze a large uh, data set, as uh, I will discuss. All right, so the, this PIO paper was uh, actually uh, reported by, uh, highlighted by APS, American Physical Society uh, Science. So, um, so they, the editor come up with a very nice title called self interacting Dark Scores Again. You may wonder why this is again here. Okay, I'll explain why this is again. 
And if you look at the web page now, there's a called attention score, which means you know how much so, how many social medias, you know, uh, cover your story. Okay, so pretty good. There's 11 news outlets. You know, five percent in top of five percent. Right. So you may wonder. Okay, you may wonder that if you have a CDM, if you change your feedback model. If you have a strong feedback, so strong such that you can change your dark matter density distribution, can you explain the diversity? People investigated that. Uh, like this is called in Europe group, uh, a group in Europe they called the Niihau simulation. So it's again eight galaxies, eight outliers. I picked in the beginning. I showed you. You look at the gray curves. Gray curves are from the simulations. All those eight galaxies are three sigma away from the uh, gray curve. The feedback is so strong that you can change the dark matter density profile so significantly, such that you can explain the galaxies with a larger density course. Because you know the you, violent feedback can you know change the potential dramatically, can reduce the dark matter essentially. However, the problem with this simulation, they cannot explain the high surface brightness high surface brightness galaxy. Those are the galaxies dominated by baryons in the central region. There's a physical reason behind this. If you have feedback with simple impl implement, you will never be able to explain the high surface brightness galaxy. Because stars behave as the collision of particles. Your feedback blow away dark matter, you also blow away stars. Right? I don't think there's any way out. Of course, you can construct a different model, but at least so far, no one has shown that. In a one, feed one simple setup, you can explain. While for SIDM, you don't need to do that. Right? So you can arrange the diversity. Yeah? So this plot on the left seems weird because it has a diversity of T max rather than a fixed T max and a diversity of T max. It's not quite the same comparison, right? So well, that, that's what they try to match, right? So they choose uh, the simulated galaxies in the range. Of course, you know, in simulation, pretty expensive to run the simulation for each galaxy. So what you do is you choose, yeah, a class of the V ma the, the, with the you know a class of simulated galaxies, and uh, you know in this range you try to see whether you can accommodate observations or not. Right. So that's what you did. Yeah. And you got the baryonic component from the previous telescope. Exactly. That's what you see in telescope. I don't want to. I, we don't model the formation history. You don't use the fit to determine that. The, all we fit is you look at the galaxy, you look at the baryon distribution, you just take it, because. After simulation, so you really don't care about the formation history. Of course, if you want to understand why the baryon distributing is that way, you have to run the full hydro simulations. But if I just want to fit the data, we assume the system is in equilibrium. That's it. Yeah, after 10 gig years, the system is in equilibrium. Right. I just take observations. All right. Then people criticize, OK, your feedback, your, your, your analytical model doesn't take into account the feedback and so on and so forth. And I say argue that you know from thermodynamics you don't need to care about that. Okay, then people run simulations. So those are the hydro simulations on cluster scales, and so there's two systems with cross section one, and this is a baryon profile. This is the NFW initial NFW from this blue curve is simulated. This is the same, and uh, this blue curve is from simulated SIDM profile. So I, I meet Andrew Robertson. He uh, you know he he at, uh, in UK he. At, Durham, um, in Copenhagen last year, he said, I run a bunch of simulations, but you know, can you take a look at whether it's a falsify your model or not? I said, send me your data. I send me the data. After 30 minutes, I produce this profile. The red curve is from analytical model I produced. We, we discussed. This is important because the SIDM distribution is sensitive to the final baryon distribution, but not to the formation history. Because once the system is in equilibrium, you don't care about the formation history, right? So then we, we wrote together, uh, we, we worked together to write a, 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 actually a letter paper. This paper was published without a free report. It was my first time. There's, so seven, there's nothing to argue about. And another criticism is that you, your sample is too small. Maybe some of the galaxies will have you know, observational errors, then you have, to, you have to take that into account. And uh, so in the, actually, in the PIO paper, we, we, we fit like 30 galaxies. So with my student, uh, we fit 135 galaxies. This is the largest data set you can get uh, for the purpose. 
because we need to know like 3.6 micron band observations because then you, you, you have a good handle on the mass to the light ratio and so on. You can fit all the galaxies. It took me like six months to fit 30 galaxies. It took my student one month to fit 135 galaxies. You see how, how efficient the student is. This is worst fit in the paper. This is worst fit. This is the largest chi-square. It's 44. Chi-square per degree of 44. Terrible, right? However, if you look at the fits, it's great. It's <laughs> by eye, because you know some of the data points are tiny, tiny error bars. They drive us uh, the, 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 the chi-square. So you don't, sometimes you, don't, you should not trust the, your chi-square per degree of freedom. But uh, so this I just show you. You can fit everything. All right, so OK, so far so good. So, so far we have focused on the diversity of rotation curve. But if you look at the spiral galaxy from another perspective, you will see something called a uniformity. This is what the, like, people like Stacy Macau, maybe you, you may heard about his name. He's a Monda guy, essentially. He says all galaxies are very well organized. If you plot, you don't plot the rotation curve, but you plot an acceleration. Acceleration goes like v squared over r, right, roughly speaking. This is a total acceleration as a function of the acceleration from baryons, rough because you know the baryon uh, thing, right? So then you have, you have to assume some mass to the light ratio and so on and so forth. Then, so we reproduce this plot. My student reproduced this plot, assume some mass to the light ratio. And you can see that this three, more than 3,000 points, you know, all are, you know, stay on this band. And you can fit it with the functional form proposed by Stacey McCoy at all. And actually, it's, oh, this is a mod, a modified gravity. Probably you don't need dark matter. Oh, OK, so how is IDM does? All right, this observations assume this mass to the light ratio. This is SIDM from the fit. You see, agreement is great. So SIDM explains both the diversity, the full range of diversity, and also the uniformity, if you want to call it uniformity. Of Spiral galaxies. Right. Then you do a lot of checks, right? You make sure that uh, you know the halo baryon relation is correct. This is stellar mass as a function of halo mass, and uh, you know that agrees very well with you would you would expect from galaxy formation, the baryonic artificial relation, and you make sure that you get a small scatter and so on and so forth. Okay. And uh, so we actually in the paper did like two independent analysis. This is you know. The blue, c blue points are from, uh, is from UCR contribution using the called control the sampling, use the tem numerical templates that my postdoc developed. And so there's like, uh, because we have like collaborators from UC Irvine, so they, they take some approximation, but they use the MC, for MC, MC sampling, right, to, to look at the self consistency. Agreement is good. You can take the analysis to other systems, like dwarf spheroidal galaxies. Those are the galaxies. Uh, dwarf galaxies living inside the Milky Way. And uh, the motion of the stellar motion of those systems are complicated because this you know, motion is random. So there's no disk. You have taken into a, a lot of uh, kinematics into account to do the fit. This, this guy, he's in the audience, uh, uh, Mario Valley. So he was uh, actually uh, a PhD student in Italy when he, we started this project. So he, he did a wonderful job to fit the data, right? So, um, so there's CDM and there's the SIDM fit. So what you can see is that, so there's like features. You can fit all those features. Although maybe people complain that maybe it's overfits, right? Well, because you have to play that uh, the stellar and isotropy and all those is a, com a bit of complicated uh, stuff. So if you are willing to play those, you can fit all those features. So in the analysis, we didn't take into account the environmental effect because those are the dwarf galaxies living in the main halos. There's a disk, there's a complicated environmental effect. So we are working on a second paper on this, try to take those into account. But the paper was published in Nature Astronomy. So you may wonder, you know, why this, this Italian student, and he's in the audience, uh, will, woke up, uh, will, will write a paper with, with, with me well, actually, he was invited to write a story behind the paper. And uh, it was also online, actually. You can see it's for the nature research community. Actually, he tells the secret. So his problem for visiting me is not to work on SIDM. His original motivation is to try to 
alleviate a personal to body problem, but it turns out uh, we get a paper done. Then now he really solved the problem. He's a post type to use it right now. So, all right. Okay. So those spheroidal galaxies now we extend it to galaxy clusters. This is data I did was uh, Manoji Kaplinghart and Sean Turing. Um, I spent about two, three years on this project. We started in you know, two years, in 2013. Um, so you can take the data, kinematic data, gravitational lending data on a cluster scale. You, you do the analysis just like what I did, right? And uh, it turns out on a cluster scale, you do see get density cores. So the core size actually is relatively small compared to the, the mass of the system you can see. If you're going to fit the data, you realize the cross-section had to be one order magnitude smaller than what you would expect in, those, in galaxies, like 0 0.1. So people usually call it a bullet cluster the strongest constraint on cross-section. No, stellar kinematics are a cluster, like 0 0.1. So you have those galaxies, low surface brightness galaxies, and uh, galaxy clusters. Right? You may think about dark matter halos as a particle colliders, is what a high energy physicists usually think about. Right? So now the question is, can you put everything together in a self-consistent picture? You have one order magnitude discrepancy in cross-section. How would you do that? Right? You would just give up. The answer is no. Actually, that discrepancy gives you a handle, actually, to measure dark matter mass. Here's how it works. First of all, you want to cook a model to give you such a large interaction. Uh, the simplest model you can think about is dark matter behave like the electron. If there's massless dark photon mediating dark matter self-interaction. But of course, you want to be a slightly more general. You add a little mass to this dark photon. So you get a potential called the Yukawa potential. Right? So the, you, you cut the interaction range. So for those who take my quantum mechanics class, everyone will be tested about the Yukawa potential. Right? Calculate the scattering cross section with the Yukawa potential. Okay. It will show up in most of the, your qualifying exam. Um, <laughs> oh, that I'm going to tell you. Okay, because you know, I know how to do it, so I just. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right, why this is? First of all, you wanted to, because with this potential, because this mass is small, so it can generate a large scattering cross section, first of all. Second, because it's a mass, the, the small mass, the, the cross-section has, has, has a velocity dependence. It goes like this, if you plot. The limit is the Coulomb interaction. The Coulomb interaction cross-section go like one over v to the fourth power. So you go like this, right? So the cluster scale is here, dwarf galaxy is well. So any model you build, you have to pass in through, you have to pass through these two regions. So with that, you can measure dark matter mass, right? So for example, you take this model, there's three parameters, coupling constant, once you fix that, Let's say you want to explain all the observations. Dwarf galaxies, low surface brightness galaxies, and the clusters. And the closed region will give you the mass and the immediate mass. Right? This is, you can determine particle physics parameter from astronomical observations without detecting dark matter. Right? It's the first time we can handle this. So even the dark matter does not interact with standard model, we can still measure it right? if you are open-minded. Right? You might say people say crazy if you, because if you think about it, you never detect a dark matter directly, but how do you assign a force you know, to it? Well, if you look at the standard model again, it's very natural to expect the dark matter has a collision. The electron has a collision. Pion, like neutrons, has a collision. That's the reason why we get this Yukawa potential in the 1930s, proposed by Yukawa. And then look at the ions, has the collisions. The ion collision actually because of, in the in the plasma, the photon has an effective mass. The potential is exactly equal potential. So when Sean and I were writing this review, we actually dig into the nuclear physics particle, nuclear physics data book. We actually dig out that people measure the neutral proton scattering cross section as a function of you know beam energy. Then I con we convert it into the cross section per mass at the velocity it goes like this. Right? This is the SIDM what you need. So you shift to the mass, slight, you know, this cross-section slightly low, you get this idea. It's not crazy. I think it's more natural than lambda CDM, I would say, because everything you see in the standard model sector has collisions. Why not in the dark matter sector? The paper was highlighted by APS, Felix. You know, they added a nice title to that. A little empty inside, right? 
So that's the reason because this paper we wrote this paper earlier. So they have like a press release earlier. So that's the reason why self-interacting dark matter scores again. You know, for the second paper, they use again. Okay, that's pretty nice. All right. So SIDM is doing pretty good job to explain all these long-standing problems. Then you can ask, what you can do with that, right? It's the end of the story. The answer is no. So let's say you can ask for what is the de detection possibility for SIDM? Really depend on assumption with this dark photon coupled to standard model or not. So let's assume, just like everyone does, is to assume it's a coupled to standard model. So story is becomes very interesting because for WIMP, you, you have the same thing, but the mass is one TV, it's a thousand times the proton mass. So this mass is so high that much higher than the nuclear recoil, you would expect. But for SIDM it's a 10 MeV, which is a comparable to the nuclear recoil. So this is a signal spectrum. And this is WIMP, this is SIDM, right? This is theoretical predictions. And if in, detec in detection, if you see the signal peaks like this, you definitely say SIDM because if, because if you, this interaction has such a momentum dependence, you can replace the nucleus by dark matter. It will give you self-interaction, right? So you cannot avoid it because this is a Feynman diagram from particle physics. You can replace, replace these two legs by dark matter right? if you see the signal. So there's a collaboration with the Panda X experiment. It's located in China, the deepest underground lab in China. So you see this Panda X logo. Um, and it was funny, the paper was published, get some attention. So I got some news report came to talk to me. There's one guy, you know, from Israel. He said I wanted to have an interview. I said, okay, that's great. Then he wrote a story, not about me, but a story about the dark matter. Then he sent me a link and he said, Oh, I've done this, so thank you for your input. And, but you couldn't, I don't think you will understand it. Well, I look it up, it's all in Hebrew. Right? So that's okay, but you can take the Google uh, Translator to do the job, to get the title right. We had 40 years of searching for dark matter lab, right? So Google Scott did a great job to translate the, our university, did a very bad job to translate my name. <laughs> Hebrew becomes this, and they're inconsistent. And they're high, <laughs> H-I-B-O and H-I-B-O, okay, but that's okay. Um, so you can search for SIDM at a particle colliders. This is a typical WIMP signal. If you collide to protons, you produce, let's say you produce WIMP. So WIMPs are invisible particles. You wouldn't be able to track it. But you can look at the, you know, the visible part. You can say, well, there's missing energy. You look at it because the, the momentum and the, and the energy is are conserved, you cannot figure out what's going on. So this is a typical signal for at a particle collider, proton, proton to mono jet plus missing. But in SIDM story, different. You still, you still have this kind of signal, but on top of that, this produced two SIDM particles will form a bound state because you have a light medium, right? So they just focus on positronium. The positronium will decay to photons or dark photons. The dark photon will decay to E plus E minus or mu plus mu minus. So you are looking for displaced lepton jets, right? So this is very different from what you would expect from the WIMP search. So Tao Xu is a visiting student from China, Zhejiang University, They've been here and working on this, this project. We are going to submit our paper soon. And we also work with the Gales group, try to implement some of the searches at the CMS experiment because it's displaced you know, vertices. It's not a kind of traditional uh, signal. Then you can ask, what are the like, early universe signals? Um, so in this kind of models, right, if you are slightly open-minded, you realize actually the pulse spectrum, you know, the pulse spectrum with it, that measures the clustering uh, of the, the dark, dark system or dark matter halos, actually will be, can be changed easily. So this is a CDM. If the dark matter can couple to something, you know, dark radiation in this kind of model, it's more natural to expect you will see those kind of oscillations. And this is called a dark acoustic oscillation. The observational consequence is that uh, it will suppress the dark matter pulse spectrum, suppress the halo mass function. So potentially, if the effect is too big, if you look at the galaxies, you don't see so many, if you look at the observations, you don't see so many galaxies. Right? If you go to high redshift, like uh, Brian here, you know, so for example, this shows, this is a CDM, this is from OMIT, this is a CDM, but if you, depending on your model parameters, the, the number of 
halos will be suppressed. Then you have to compare with observations like a high redshift galaxy, and you count how many galaxies I have, and then compare to halo. Then you can potentially put the constraints on those models, and maybe this is discovery opportunity. The cool thing about this is that different models uh, can, modi can be specified by a, a temperature, called a kinetic decoupling temperature. This is the particle physics parameter. This is determined by particle physics models. So using high ratio of the galaxy surface, you are able to put the constraints on the particle parameter. Right? So this is kind of the interplay between particle physics and astrophysics and astronomy. And uh, could it change your reionization his history? Like uh, Anson is interesting, or you know, George could be interested in this. Right? Could it change the reionization history and so on and so forth. So there's a lot of kind of interplay you can do. The final topic I wanted to kind of interesting, which I wanted to emphasize is, or mention is that for self-gravitating system, actually the system has negative heat capacity. So which means if you extract more ener energy, heat, from the system, the heat in the, the system becomes hotter. This is true for any self-gravitating system, like a globular cluster is a kind of one example, right? So for self-interactions, because the collisions can transport heat, so if you have collisions, you always transport the heat from the inner halo to the outer halo. The halo will eventually collapse to what? To a black hole, right? So the ultimate destiny for an SIDM halo is a black hole. But yeah, we are safe because this process is very slow. i show you an example. If you take a cross section three, that is a value that I fixed to explain the diversity, right? So this is, I take the evolution history, like to address uh, Nathan's point. This is, again, an analytical model. It's like a modified analytical model. And it, t equals zero, it's an FW. After you wait for two giga years, the density profile, this 10 giga years, shallow, very shallow density profile. This is a core collapse will happen. The density becomes dr dramatically high in the central region, basically it goes to infinity because you, you always extract the heat. The system will just collapse, collapse to a black hole. So it takes about 173 giga years for this to happen. So age of the galaxy 10 giga years. You wouldn't be able to see this. Right? So that's OK. However, the story could be different. If the collisions have a dissipation effect, there's energy loss, then you can speed up this process. So in this paper, we talk about this possibility. Another possibility is that if you have barriers, Right? The barrier, you know, I mentioned that if the barrier potential is deep, actually it can suck SID particles to build up the density. So this is shown by, you know, Omid, the audience. So if you take some barrier potential to start with, this is NFW at t equals zero giga year. One giga year density is here. It's completely different from here. Two, five giga years over there. Ten giga years over there. So there's a core collapse. You, you mean the bounce state between two particles? Yeah. Looking at the whole SAD particles combined. Yeah, that, that's the reason why a like, globular cluster would like, collapse to a black hole, because there's you know, the two body, three body interaction. It's a good point. Uh, for those systems, it's, we're still trying to figure out that because those are the like, individual particles, like I, the gas system, right? if you think about this. I wouldn't expect this will happen. Because you know the, the individual gas really is negligible in terms of this mass of gravitational force, right? It's a good question. Um, so okay, so for some galaxies, I think the core collapse can really happen. So then the question you always ask is, uh, can you make use of the the, the, the physics to, to make some story up? The answer is yes, because if core collapse happens, it collapses to a black hole. You know, there's a big mystery in astrophysics that we observe the high, reg high redshift quasars interpreted as a massive black holes. So where are those black holes come from? It's a question, right? So we don't know the answer. A project I'm working on is that use this to see the black hole in the early universe and to see whether you can reproduce all the observed quasars and so on and so forth. All right, so this is a summary of my talk. Um, so I briefly talk about the dark matter and normal matter interactions. 
So there are very strong constraints. In this talk, I hope I have convinced you there are strong hints that for dark matter self interactions, it solves long standing small scale problems only with one parameter cross section. It turns on the cross section. That's it. Right? At present, SIDM is the only mechanism that has been shown to explain the both diversity and uniformity. So I use the word very carefully, okay? Has been shown, right? Doesn't mean that there's no, this doesn't mean that this is the only solution, but no one has shown for the, the large sample of the data. Our results are robust to bear on feedback and galaxy formation history due to the collision noise normalization. All right? So when I sometimes give the talks uh, to my particle physicists, uh, my friends, they will say, well, okay, it's interesting, but you know, you are trained as a particle physics, but you are not doing like a high energy physics. But to me, I think that's the same story because we want to understand a dark matter. So in particle physics, we build a different ca particle colliders on different energy scales to probe particle interaction. Like the B factory, low energy collider, lip, right? Uh, there's a lepton collider, and uh, LHC, large collider, high energy. And in our universe, actually, there are dark matter colliders. These are the dark matter halos, right? Like dwarf galaxy, middle size, Milky Way size galaxy, and a galaxy cluster. And you take all the observations from all scales, and you can kind of try to understand the particle nature of dark matter, as I have shown you as an example. So I thought this is, I think this is a good analogy. I usually end my talk with this slide. Surprisingly, you know, a couple of months ago, I looked online, actually, Stefano Pufumo actually added that, you know, analogy in his textbook for the, an, intera an introduction, to, uh, introduction to particle dark matter. He says, you know, my friend and a colleague, you know, has a very suggestive way of drawing parallel, blah, 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 okay? But now, I, when I saw this, I realized that, you know, three years ago, I gave a talk at Santa Barbara. He asked me, can you send me your slides? I think that's the reason, you know, because he was writing a book about this. All right, so I would like to send my main collaborators. Those are the UCR uh, people. Uh, I, I sh show their work most, uh, most of, uh, for most of them, I have shown their work. Uh, this, for Gerardo, um, he's a third year student. I, we don't have time to show his work. And uh, this Renata is an undergraduate student. She is analyzing some simulation data with Peter. And uh, she uh, received a very prestigious award this year. And uh, those are the collaborators outside of Manoj Kaplinghart, my long-term collaborator. He's an astrophysicist and cosmologist. Sean Turing at York. Yong Yang at Shanghai Jiao Tong University. So he did uh, the you know, experimental analysis of from the, uh, he, he took the, the Panda-X data. He's a pen, in the Panda-X collaboration. He did the most of the analysis. Andrew Robinson from the UK. So he did the simulation on a cluster. Maro Vary, as I mentioned, and Yi Ming Chung, he's a postdoc at Boston University. The work is supported by DOE and I have my funds. Thank you very much. <laughs> yes? So you know the density for the dark matter around the sun, for example. Yes. Oh, I, I see. If you assume cross section, um, if you assume cross section one or two near the solar system, the dark matter particles will collide about two or three times per age of the galaxy. But that's enough to thermalize. One or two collisions are enough to thermalize the system. Because if you go to inner region, the collision rate will be high. Right, so for direct detection, the big assumption you have to make is that you assume the dark matter interacts with the standard model, right? Of course, I hope this is the case. Everyone hopes this is the case. But it may not be the case. So be prepared. First of all, this is my first answer. Second answer is that if you do see some signals, then it's very important to, uh, to figure out what the signal spectrum is. Then because that, it will indirectly measure this mediate mass. So I don't think there's any kind of, because 
In the Wimper paradigm case, you have very good prediction in terms of the delicate detection, right? What, when you would, I mean, you know, what cross section you, you are aiming for. But for years, we don't see any Wimper signals. People actually give up this goal. People say, just let's build a bigger, bigger detector. See what we can get, right? If you ask a delicate detection people, they will not give you an answer that, oh, we are able to do something like this. They will say, oh, how can we reach the neutrino flow? This is the current goal. But there's no lower bound. There's no lower bound. In principle, there's no lower bound, right? Why the dark matter has to be so kind to us, right? That's the reason why I kind of switch you to the astrophysical problem of dark matter, right? Why the dark matter has to be so nice to us? There's no reason, right? There's no reason. Nature doesn't have to be kind to us. Right? You have to take all the, uh, the, the possibilities. But the cool thing about with this is the data have accumulated enough for us to say something. Right? So I, I think that, that is the, the meaningful uh, way to go. Yeah. No, it's not important. Yeah. Look at the, the halo velocity. 200 kilometers per second, much smaller speed of light. However, if you clap, if you want your model collapse to a black hole, yes, the relativistic effect becomes very important. So you can ask what the condition is to, to, to collapse to a black hole. Yeah, that's what you need to take in a relativistic effect. Yes. Um, yeah, it's a good question. For example, there's a, when we do the fit, actually, there's one issue is what mass to the light ratio you're going to take, right? For high surface brightness galaxies, it may not be even a constant. There's a gradient. So in this analysis, we didn't take that into account. However, I do have a backup slide to show you that the mass to the light ratio we take is, is reasonable according to the population synthesis model. Let's say for the 3.6 micron, on average, the peak is around 0 0.5. This is what you would expect in the population synthesis model. But for individual galaxy, yeah, details could be, some details could be uh, emitted in this uh, discussion. Yeah. Yeah, for self-interactions, it's okay, because self-interactions cares about the particle collisions, not the power spectrum itself, yeah. right? In terms of people say, well, maybe you're gonna solve, you know, missing satellites problem if you take the problem seriously. Then take the current observations, there's a tension. You cannot solve the missing satellites problem if this is a problem, okay? But then people say, well, okay, how seriously you model your, like the temperature and so on and so forth. So there's some wiggle room over there, but I think, uh, you know, towards the zero so order, you know, the lambda alpha constraint is there. Should be. But this decoupling factor also is related to the cross-section, right? So also yeah, cross exactly. So this is related to cross-section, but it's related to the cross-section. You know, in the zero so order, you're correct, but in details, it also inter uh, related to cross-section, how the how the mediator couples dark neutrinos, for example, with additional parameter over there, right? It also related to the temperature ratio between the two sectors, and so on and so forth. So in the paper, we, over there, we have a kind of a, try to have a comprehensive plot that if you put into all the constraints from stellar kinematics, what is the loom you can play with? Uh, what's the parameter space left <coughs> that the CMB lima alpha can put a constraint on?
Okay, great. Thank you.